Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this um, session on, on a state all and war in the in the formation of, of Iraq, offered by Nida Al Ahmad. Offered by Nida Al Ahmad, the lecturer of uh, politics and international relations at Edinburgh University, and uh, which corresponds to the um, to the seventh session of the program Aula Ara Universitaria, the Arab Classroom. Um, organized in collaboration with the um, BA in International Relations of the Complutense University of Madrid, and also the BA in, in Philosophy, Politics and, and Economics at the Autonoma University of, of Madrid. Um, in this respect, we will count with the participation of Isaias Barreñada, lecturer, lecturer of International Relations and coordinator of the BA in International Relations at the Complutense University, who will, will offer the, the first reaction to Nida Lachman's um, lecture. And I would like to, to um, welcome all the students, especially some of the newcomers that are coming from both BAs uh, to attend this lecture and, and follow this, this session. Um, as some of you know, Aula Arabe Universitaria is a program of collaboration um, with the university programs of Madrid and Cordoba that um, Casa Arabe organizes with the, uh, in Madrid and Cordoba, is with both uh, university programs of the both cities. And in this, um, in this program, um, the university programs uh, propose the, um, the issues and speakers. And then we organize the conference um, for them. And in, there are themes and issues and, and speakers um, designed for the students and the curricula of this, of this master of BA programs in that sense. So in, it's a way, um, I mean, the objective of the program is to promote uh, knowledge about the Arab world and the Islamic world and in a way to complete and enrich the, the university programs in the, in this, in the universities. Um, and also a way of also contributing to crossing disciplines or so the famous interdisciplinary approach in the sense that even if the um, sessions are designed for each program, um, the students of the other programs are welcome. And then at the end of the, of the year, we grant a certificate to those students um, participating or assisting to more than 50% of the, of the conference. So in that sense, um, just to remind you that for those um, students following online, that they can register also the attendance through the chat of the, of the YouTube uh, channel. And because, as you know, the, the people um, or the students assisting um, in the in the hall, they can do it through the passport to the Arab world that we we stamp like a, uh, any other passport when you enter the, the room to to come to this new, new wall in a way. So I would like to thank um, once more Nida Al Ahmad um, because we had a previous session also of the seminar, but I would like to thank her a lot for coming here and also participating, not only in this session, but the whole uh, day we're having of exchange about these issues. Um, and also uh, Isaias Barreñada for his whole support to the Aula Arabe program since the beginning. And we could say that he's one of the uh, founding, founding fathers of the, of the program. And uh, we always count with the, with the program, with the national relations of the competency and are very active in the conference. So I would really like to thank him for his his support, and in that sense, I will just pass um, the floor. We will give the floor to Nida. Nida, whenever you want. Then we have the the first reaction by Professor Barañada, and then we open the debate with the public. Thanks. Thank you, Lydia. Um, just so that I don't go over time, I'm going to put. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for the invite, and I'm really happy to be here. And especially, uh, you know, thank you, Olivia, for being in touch and initiating this. And also, I, I, I don't know if they're here. Irena and Ruth have been amazing in um, in making me feel welcome, and I thank them for that. Um, coming to Madrid uh, has been such a pleasure. I had such a great time today talking to everyone. And for all of you who missed the first session, you missed a lot because I think these two sessions are indeed very much uh, connected. And you see it's more of a, a dialogue, uh, which I'm looking forward to carry um, uh, this evening. 
So this talk is based on a recent chapter that was published uh, in, in the volume, A Critical Political Economy of the Middle East and North Africa uh, that appeared with Stanford University Press earlier this year. The ideas in, in, in this chapter, which is also my talk, um, are also connected to a book project that I'm now finalizing uh, called State Matters, the State, Its Significance, it, Its Matters, and Its Experts in the Case of Iraq. So I'm more interested in the state uh, than oil, but then, you know, of course, when we talk about Iraq, they're very much interconnected. Um, so, to, you know, because uh, I don't have slides, um, I, I thought I'll perhaps draw your attention before I start to the two main takeaway points um, of the talk. Um, the first one is methodological or perhaps theoretical. It depends on how you look at it. I suggest, I will suggest today that to understand a contemporary phenomenon such as state consolidation or the role of oil economy, one has to take a long historical view. This allows us to decenter the causal power of certain concepts and experiences and realign them as effects in longer trends and or parts in a puzzle rather than the core causality of political life. In the case of Iraq, it will become apparent, I hope, uh, that a long historical view decenters the colonial experience as the starting formative moment for a state that appears at once artificial and at the center of gravity of all politics. It also decenters the role of oil as depicted by the Ronti state theory as being responsible for shaping the regime type within a state. So that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is, uh, which is really the main argument here, uh, that uh, it centers around three themes that often appear when one studies Iraq, the state, oil, and war. I argue that those three uh, are interrelated themes rather than uh, bounded categories that determine certain political or political economy effects. The markers in historical processes that since the late 19th century involved, um, the for, involved the formation of social relations organized by conceptual categories. So we recognize them as class, sect, nation, and gender. So these th three themes are responsible for, um, for the uh, production of these, of, these, um, of these social formations. These social relations have informed and constituted one another within uh, particular material and historical contexts. In what follows, I elaborate on how to employ these three thematic threads, state, oil, and war, to better understand the formation of the modern political economy of Iraq. In this discussion, I'll elaborate further on the transformation of social relations, particularly class. It will be, you know, um, kind of sporadic, but I'll, I'll point it out when it comes up. Uh, there will be many references to the 19th century developments, so I urge you to please bear with me. They are, in addition to being interesting stories, um, I think they are historically and, and analytically relevant to our, to our understanding of Iraq's contemporary political economy. So let me start with the state. The high political stakes that emerged as a result of the 2003 war prompted debates on whether the Iraqi state is an artificial entity. The standard artificiality argument, uh, which many of you must have heard before, is that the Iraqi state, like other Middle Eastern states, was the result of the French and British colonial imposition of borders based on the 1916 sykes picot Agreement, which led to Britain establishing Iraq under a League of Nations mandate in 1920. Academics and political commentators from a wide spectrum of political orientations, whether on the left or the right, uh, 2003 war proponents and apologists, Arab nationalists, even ISIS have all made the same argument. Iraq is an artificial state. In fact, the current Iraqi borders were produced like borders anywhere else, over time rather than in one event. Their construction did not start with the colonial maps, nor did end up uh, with them. 
it involved, and I'm quoting here Sarah Pursley, a lot of work and a lot of violence. This work and violence were committed by colonizing armies and officers, by colonized peoples and leaders, nationalists, national governments, and neighbors who were constructing and redrawing their own boundaries. Processes of modern state building, state consolidation, and state expansion were already underway during the 19th century under the Ottoman Empire. Iraq's political economy has since been entangled with efforts to consolidate and expand state power. I suggest that those efforts of state consolidation and expansion of state power can be understood uh, to revolve around three main processes. I mean, there are too many threes here, I just realized, but <laughs> it's, it's one of my favorite numbers. Um, so these three processes are the infrastructure uh, networks, development projects and uh, land and population control. So now I'll, I'll go over them and give you uh, the promised stories. Infrastructure networks. Infrastructure has been instrumental in extending the state's reach and control, facilitating movements of people, ideas, and goods over space and time in ways that caused many fundamental changes in the power dynamics among people and localities. And that's, you know, I mean, this is something that you observe anywhere in the world, but um, so I'm going to talk about how it worked in Iraq in particular. So due to this role, the state as a site of political contestation and facilitator of economic activities has been very prominent in modern Iraqi history. The extension of infrastructure was remarkable and transformative in, um, again, three moments in Iraqi modern history, the second half of the 19th century, the 1950s and the 1970s. These were the productive moments. Likewise, the destruction of infrastructural networks, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, um, have been transformative, um, had also been transformative. And I'll out outline how uh, in, in, in the examples that follow. So it had three, you know, three moments of, of very constructive effect and two historical periods where uh, they, they were destroyed and, and, and also transform the social relations. One of the earliest transformations in political economy of Iraq came as a subsequence of the opening of the Suez Canal. It transformed the nature of the uh, product of productive and wealth generating activities and transformed the nature of wealth and class composition. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 and the related introduction of steam navigation on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers before that in, in 1858, but then you know, now they're connected through the Suez Canal to the world, enabled Iraq to become a cash crop exporter. These events marked the initiation of Iraq's integration into the world economy. Yusuf Ghnayma, a prominent Iraqi financial and political figure during the monarchical period, and this period is from 1921 to 58, suggested that the Suez Canal, quote, brought life to our trade and connected it to Europe and the whole civilized world. In other words, I can say here that it is the spine of Iraq's trade, end of quote. Just like, and you know, he mentioned that, it has been the spine of the British Kingdom. The opening of the canal encouraged and made possible the transformation of Iraq's agricultural practices, especially in the Middle Euphrates and the southern regions, from one that was focused on subsistence to one focused on profit making. Iraq's exports mainly to India and Europe included grains, dates, wool, leather, opium, and other primary products. Most of its imports consisted of consumer goods. Um, one consequence of the multifaceted transformation of trade and agricultural practices was the transformation of the nature of wealth, and by extension, the transformation of social classes. For example, and I think I mentioned that in my uh, question before, the Baghdadi Jewish Sassoon family became financially, financially, financially prominent due to international trade opportunities in silk, cotton, and opium. 
the newly introduced naval lines also encouraged the stations along, uh, in, encouraged the uh, establishment of stations along the Tigris rivers. And those stations service ships and passengers and then grew into cities with time. So you see these, you know, the kind of business that, and, and the kind of um, trades that started to emerge as a result of these um, uh, naval lines. Massive infrastructural expansions that linked Iraq to the world have made possible new ways of generating wealth through international trade and flourishing of service industry, which is what I just mentioned, and the introduction of new industries associated with these services. At the same time, those same infrastructural expansions have contributed to the demise of other economic activities and centers in Iraq. And then, you know, again, this is the class transformation, you know, who some, you know, um, kind of movement and emergence and, and collapse of, of certain, um, of certain um, economic communities. The service industry, for example, that catered to the Shia pilgrims uh, traveling from Iran to India to visit shrines in cities of Najaf and Karbala suffered after the launch of the Iraqi railways. So between 1919 and 1924, British and Iraqi government, uh, governments introduced regulations to manage the entry and length of stay of pilgrims. So they in, you know, initiated visas and fees and things like that. This was one component to enforce uh, of, of efforts to enforce the state's territorial control and demark its borders. These developments, so this effort of, of the state to control its borders, it combined or, or you know, combined with this new infrastructure and way of transport um, you know, of, of railways and taxi services, encouraged pilgrims to buy cheap train tickets. So rather than take um, days to travel and stop in different towns, they just would take the train, it was much cheaper for them, uh, visit the holy places and go back to Iran, thus contributing to the economic decline of what once was a flourishing service industry uh, servicing the pilgrims. Um, now I'll move to the 1950s where there was a significant infrastructure expansion and later also in the 1970s. And these two were due to the increased oil revenues and the emergence of the developmentalist welfare state in the 70s and early 80s. The accomplishments of the 50s and 70s and early 80s suffered tremendously in the following decades. So the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted between 1980 and 88, as well as the 91 Gulf War and the era of international economic sanctions, uh, which lasted the whole 1990s through 2003, they all have basically um, uh, led to the um, weakening of the economy and almost uh, collapse of the infrastructure. Weak state control of the borders during that period have helped turn interstate roads, some built in the 80s in war-related efforts into smuggling routes that contributed to the emergence of a war economy. So, you know, this is me trying to interlink different eras together and, and their results. And now I'd like to draw an example that I think best illustrates how infrastructure can act as a nod of economic and political power. This is the example of electricity in post-2003 Iraq. Rehabilitation of the national grid after the Iran-Iraq war was postponed and the damages suffered during this period were compounded by the effects of over decades of comprehensive international economic sanctions. Within days of the occupation of Baghdad in April 2003, American engineers arrived as part of a team in charge of uh, restoring, um, in this order, electricity and then water and then the sewage system. Of course, none of this uh, happened. <laughs> not the water, not the electricity, not the sewage system. The team's task was complicated by the fact that the oil industry's production capacity was radically diminished due to the extreme reduction in electricity supply after the occupation. And then here you see that, uh, you know, the electricity in Iraq depended on, on the oil and the oil, you know, on, on oil to um, uh, 
to move the to, to create electricity and and oil uh, as well relied on on the electrical power to um, to to operate uh, the the stations so this electricity oil interdependence created opportunities for both criminal and political sabotage the immediate and radical reduction in post-2003 electrical supply was due to, crim to criminal activities. So 50 electrical transmission towers were damaged due to the pre-invasion bombing. By mid-June uh, 2003, looters who sold precious metals to Iran and Kuwait destroyed 700 towers. So 50 were destroyed by war, 700 were destroyed by crime. Criminal activities were soon combined with insurgency inflicted sabotage. The electricity and oil infrastructure were heavy, heavily reliant on each other and physically met in spots where they fed energy into one another. So, you know, this is what I explained before. Oil dependent on uh, electrical energy and, and the other way around. So there were nodes where the two infrastructures would meet. And these spots, physically, these uh, spots became attractive targets for insurgency that was trying to undermine the new state building project. Between 2003 and 2006, oil and ele electricity infrastructure was subjected to over 300 attacks and multiple criminal assaults. Electricity generation and supply did not improve until 2008, which is after the end of the 2006 civil war. But it remains a major problem in Iraq until today. So the infrastructure was not only interdependent on networks that facilitated everyday life, including economic activities, they were themselves um, and I caught here uh, an anthropologist who called it uh, of, of South Africa, a political terrain for the negotiation of moral political questions. I have now given you an overview of the um, role of infrastructure networks and the, in, the, and in the formation of Iraqi politics and political economy. So moving to the second uh, process, which is the developmental projects. The history of development has uh, recently been revisited by many scholars, ma mainly historians, who aim at constructing a narrative that is wider and covering the scope of practices involved and actors affected, that's you know, the wit, and deeper in understanding the nuance, contradictions, and interplay of ideas and on the ground politics and longer in terms of its historical route. So what I'm trying to say here, I'm actually using the term development with, um, um, with a lot of caution. I am taking the work of Joseph Hodge, uh, who's you know, a historian who, uh, and who wrote about the history of development to draw in my analysis of the significance of developmental projects. So the historical contextualization that Hodge brings together decenters the dominance of the term development in its normative and par paradigmatic meaning, which we all, I think, for the most part, hold or understand when we say development. A distinction that might help forming an, an historically nuanced understanding of developmental practices is between development as an imminent process in which a crisis must be seen as something intrinsic to the process itself and development as an intentional, usually state-directed practice. That's his words. Seen this way and looking back at the early industrialization and colonial histories, states have often introduced development in response to crises brought about by capitalist transformations. Taking this wider definition of development, it is possible to trace developmental efforts in Iraq from the late Ottoman period to the present, demonstrating that the state has always responded to material and social crises through, among other things, developmental projects. Of the early and most significant interventions um, that had lasting legacy uh, actually took place in the second half of the 19th century, and we still see its effects today. So this is you know, one key story that uh, I hope um, you can remember because it will, it will keep 
coming up. So Mithat Basha, who was the governor of Baghdad, Ottoman governor of Baghdad between 1869 and 1872, so it's not a long time, but he did a lot, was the first Ottoman governor to introduce grand developmental projects, including modern school system, a tram line, the first hospital in Iraq, Iraq's first newspaper, modern urban planning and land reforms. So he had all of these plans, you know, I'm not saying that he was necessarily successful, but he did, you know, initiate these things. So his projects were grand in their ambition, but uh, were part of multiple Ottoman attempts that started before his term in office and continued after he left. And these attempts were to centralize governance and establish deeper and wider control of the state. Mithat Pasha commissioned a Belgian engineer to build the city of Nasiriya in southern Iraq. And this is the first Iraqi city to follow a modern grid plan. Currently, it's Iraq's fourth largest city. It was named Nasiriya after Nasir al-Sadun, who was the first tribal leader to become an Ottoman government, government official. So this is, you see, the um, co-optation of, of the tribes into, into the state, so to speak. Al-Sadun was a district governor of the newly established administrative unit of Liwa al-Muntafiq, or the Muntafiq district, with its administrative capital, Nasiriya, named after um, uh, Nasr al-Sadun himself. So the city was um, so that's the city was built with Ottoman orders, European expertise, Iraqi labor, and uh, to house the newly appointed governor, who was instrumental, as we will see, in the creation of large-scale private land ownership in southern Iraq, which I will soon address. Modern education was another way that the state has sought to expand its control over the country. It introduced discipline, like everywhere else, ideas and skills that would contribute to the creation of a modern state order. With the expansion of uh, the administrative state structure in the 1920s and the increasing ties to global economy, the advantages of modern education as a tool of upward social mobility became clear to the population. For example, members of the Jewish community had a Western style education and were often multilingual. Their skills and education allowed them to occupy many professional positions and become, uh, that became available in the 20s in education, law, medicine, as well as the state bureaucracy and private sector companies. Modern education affected the landscape of political movements in Iraq and the composition of political elite as well. It contributed to class transformation in the country in different time periods. When first introduced, it helped create a new educated, often urban middle class known as Afendiya. Members of this class participated in national and ideological movements in Iraq that crossed communal and sectarian boundaries. And I find the work of Orit Bashkin to be quite um, uh, helpful in, in, in understanding this, uh, this um, particular phase. Another social and class transformation was the rise of the lower middle Sunni officers into the ranks of government and military with the establishment of the Iraqi state. Ottoman schools, which started to open during the second half of the 19th century, were both military and civilian. The military schools were numerous in Baghdad, and unlike the, um, the civilian ones, were actually uh, very attractive for uh, Sunni families of humble backgrounds. And the reason why is because the government paid all student expenses at these boarding schools, which offered a path to military college in Istanbul, as well as future military and state careers. So the family doesn't have to pay for the food or clothes or the education and uh, their children have a chance to go to Istanbul and become part of the state apparatus. Between 1923 and 1941, most of Iraq's prime ministers were graduates of military colleges. So this is you know, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, but we see kind of the effects uh, carrying on um, during the monarchical period. This again is an example of class transformation that has been associated with efforts to consolidate and expand the state in Iraq. 
Increased ordinance in the monarchical 1950s led to surges in developmental projects of which education had been the most significant. The state's interest in education continued uh, through the Republican era, which is, um, you know, I'm defining it, you know, kind of stopping with the Baptist, so 1958 to 1962, when, for example, primary school education became compulsory in Iraq. The most significant expansion of the educational system took place after the Ba'ath took over, which is in the 70s and early 80s. The Iraqi developmental state manifested most prominently after the oil industry's na nationalization in 1972. The educational system during the early Ba'athist period focused on eradicating illiteracy, and as a 1974 Ba'ath Party document states, quote, science and technology in education to provide the personnel required in the various fields of development. So science and technology, have you noticed that it's not um, philosophy and, uh, and, and uh, theory? Free public education was established and universities were founded in major cities in Iraq's north, center and south. Illiteracy was reduced from 55% to 11%. To 11 between 1980 and 1988. So within eight years, there was a, a major uh, improvement. As before, public education helped transform social and economic relations in the 80s. So kind of like the, you know, the periods before that, that I've mentioned. The military draft for the, but, but then, you know, this transformation is also, its effect is combined with the uh, effects of, of the war. So, you know, the two come together. Um, so the military draft during the Iran-Iraq war reduced the number of men in the civilian labor force. Women, now literate because of this, um, uh, you know, th this campaign, um, women now literate with many holding professional qualifications filled a significant gap in the labor force. So, you know, you see kind of, a, a, again, a gender and, and class shift in, in the country. Even though the Iran-Iraq war resulted in a significant increase of women in the labor force, it also diminished the developmental capacity that allowed women to become professionals to begin with, it, you know, the capacity that allowed them to receive that education and training. The war and later sanctions led to the deterioration of previously sponsored state projects, including the educational system. Until recently, the state was not able to recover the 1970s educational success records. The implementation and later deterioration of state-sponsored developmental projects set new socioeconomic and political trends in motion, including further class transformations and class-based politics. An example that illustrates the uh, persistence of such trends are the dynamics of the 2006 civil war. A major player in the civil war was the Mahdi army, the military wing of the subject movement. The membership in this movement and its militias drew heavily on the residents of Sadr city, a neighborhood in the outskirts of Baghdad. Sadr city was first founded as Thoda, which means revolution city during the early Republican era. It was an urban development project that sought to organize shanty towns established by rural migrants from southern Iraq during the monarchical period after the implementation of a land reform um, uh, law, I suppose, yes. So Thauda City, later renamed Saddam City and now Southern City, just gives you kind of a the spirit of the time, uh, is an example of a co-constitution of economic transformations, state-led developmental projects and political power contestation. So, you know, the state tried to incorporate and um, to kind of build these shanty towns in an effort at social control rather than to uh, integrate them uh, into, uh, into society and thus doing little to transform the socioeconomic position of the, of the residents. And so these uh, Sarayev or these shanty towns have always been home for both secular and Islamic proletarian movements. Most famously, uh, the Communist Party of Iraq had its stronghold there. And now uh, the Sadrist movement and Islamist movement 
uh, and also it, um, it, it became home uh, or historically for those breaking the, the law. Urban developments during the early Bathurst period included land distribution schemes in Baghdad to civil servants. This led to the emergence of new middle class neighborhoods that were mixed in their sectarian composition. These neighborhoods, unlike the cohesive and historic center of civil disobedience, Southern City, became prone to the devastating effects of the civil war and attacks from all sides. The sanctions and civil war drove many of their inhabitants, uh, which are middle class civil servants, and the, who are the technically skilled population that was, was both the product and the basis of the modern state. And these are the words of Peter Harling had sent them to exile. The same circumstances coupled with the lack of social and financial capital left the youth of Southern City little hope for social mobility. And, um, uh, and, and through now the deteriorated education or the impoverished army. So they can't join the army and the education system is quite poor. Instead of migrating, which they can't during or couldn't during the 1990s, they were left with menial jobs and criminal activities as the only viable economic choices. The suggest movement was as a result, partly defined by its working class and urban poor composition. In sharp con contrast to other Shia political parties who were in exile during the Ba'athist period and closer to the religious establishment and the Shia merchant and landed classes. I have so far addressed two processes. I, I, I promise it will go faster from now, um, in which the state consolidation efforts were taking place in modern Iraq, infrastructure networks and development projects. So now moving to the third and last process, and that's of land and population control. Land both as territory and as taxable commodity. So, you know, physically the land, and also if you think about it as a commodity that you can tax, was significant to the Ottoman state's effort in the, in, you know, the effort to expand its territorial control and rationalize its bureaucracy to increase its tax revenue. Tribal confederations at, at that time composed a major challenge that stood between the Ottoman state and access to land. Only 9% of the population during the late 19th century and early 20th century lived in urban centers. The majority were tribes, um, different kinds, uh, nomadic, semi-settled and sedentary tribes. Tribes in central and southern Iraq formed confederations, so almost a bit like city-states. So confederations that control territory and impose tariffs, for example, on ships passing through what they consider to be their territories. Intertribal trades, uh, raids, and revolts against forms of state control were common. In return, Ottoman governors used different tactics to control these tribes, including cooptation of tribes against one another and cutting water supplies to the marshes where insurgent tribes would hide. And this is a tactic that was used by the, um, by the uh, Bathurst uh, state um, you know, uh, later on the drying of the marshes. So, but with various degrees of success. The Ottoman Land, Co uh, land Code of 1858, which, you know, if you, if you study the history of the region, it's quite famous or infamous, was introduced to Iraq during the governorship of Mithat Pasha in 1871. So um, within the Ottoman legal framework, land was not, that was not privately owned or mulk, or waqf, uh, waqf means an Islamic endowment. So if it went private or an endowment belonged to the state and was referred to as Miri. The land code of 1858 introduced a new kind of land holding called tapu. So tapu gave legal and heritable rights of, uh, you know, to individuals while the ultimate ownership of the land remained in the state, hand of the state. So it's kind of a, in between system. While it is generally accepted that the main purpose of introducing this land code was to generate tax revenues, uh, Halil Wadi, who's an Iraqi sociologist, suggests another related reason, population control. 
So he relies on the, uh, in his interpretation on the memoirs of Mithat Pasha, who considered different reasons why Southern Iraq was um, always full of uh, tribal unrest. He, you know, the Pasha was thinking about, or wrote in his diaries about, you know, different explanations that were common at the time. One that they, these were Shia tribes, where the Ottomans were Sunnis, and or these tribes were mostly motivated by a desire to evade taxes. But the Pasha thought that these were not convincing reasons. Um, so I'm quoting here. It is possible that these large numbers of people, it is not possible that these large numbers of people revolt and spill their own blood just to obey the orders of the tribal leaders. If one were to look at the state of affairs, it will appear to him that the source of conflict is land. So the Pasha solution was to transfer the holdings of public land to tribes with a new topo system. He set up a Bureau of Land Registration, hoping this would transform the tribes into productive citizens. Um, so whether it's population control or increasing tax revenue, either way, both functions serve the same purpose, which is to consolidate the state. The, um, so the, this type of system links us back to uh, Nasser Estadun, who was mentioned briefly before. Methad Pasha convinced Nasser Sadun, the leader of the Sadun tribe, to become the governor of the Muntafiq, as I mentioned before, and build the new city uh, of Nasiriyah. At the same time, the uh, land code of 1858 was introduced to the land of Al Muntafiq. But many tribes that Al Sadun, you know, was part of that confederation, many tribes in this confederation were reluctant to register in the land bureau. So up until this point, this, this district, the Muntafiq, or the land within what became a district, was effectively tribal land that was, you know, the confederate was under the control of a confederation. Um, and did, you know, did not rely on the legal demarcation and enforcement um, but on, of, of the state, but on the ability of the tribe to defend its territory against other tribes and the government. So that's how they owned the land, not, you know, not through legal documents. So, uh, you know, the, the, this is the confederation, but then the Sadduns among this confederation were different. They, they were not reluctant to register the Tapu system. And as a result, most of the Montafiq land was registered as the property of this one tribe out of the whole confederation. So as you can imagine, this uh, created um, kind of uh, rifts and, and uh, within the confederation and weakened it. So with, the, with this uh, implementation of the land code, the Saduns accumulated considerable wealth until the turn of the century when other tribesmen, now their tenants, refused to pay rents to the uh, owners, uh, the Saduns. In consequence, the Saduns leased the land to small sections of tribal sheikhs, causing further splits and tensions within the Muntafiq. So this is a strong a confederation that now has been weakened in that, in that uh, almost unintentional way. So these tensions continued through World War I, and uh, when land tenants com completely refused to pay their dues to the landlords, and these um, events marked the weakening, as I said, of one of the biggest and strongest tribal confederation in southern Iraq. And this is when, um, you know, I think uh, when Hanna Batatu uh, kind of um, uses that as an example of the decline of the power of the tribe in Iraq. While the introduction of the land code succeeded in the weakening of tribal power, this did not automatically translate into the expansion of state administrative control over land or tribe. So that was the purpose, but you know, the, the reasoning behind it, um, behind the introduction of this law to weaken the tribes in order to expand the state, the tribes were weakened and, and the state was not able to expand. The continuous and intertribal disputes brought about by the land code policies proved the inability of the central government to bring these territories or the tribes generally under its administrative control and led to the suspension of uh, further uh, land deeds in 81. So that scheme was uh, stopped by 1881. 
this situation would change very quickly with uh, leading to the one of the biggest social transformations associated with state consolidation in Iraq. Let me have a look. Okay. Whoopsie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the mandate and monarchical governments were more successful. So uh, what they did is they actually enforced um, enforce these uh, ownership laws and um, and granted tribal leaders land ownership in exchange for their political support. Uh, but that was then at the expense of the tenants or the you know previous um, uh, tribesmen. Um, and, and that kind of created that if there's an urban political elite that also now started to acquire property in similar manner, and that resu resulted in concentration of land ownership among few families. So again, this transformation. Um, okay. Uh, right, so, you know, the, the these, you know, then there were more laws introduced in the 30s, and these uh, placed extreme financial burdens on the farmers in these lands that have become private, including, you know, the uh, prohibition to leave the land if a farmer was in debt to the owner or the government. So it's almost slavery. So the implementation of this law now possible with the British and, and uh, the, the uh, monarchical um, uh, use of force have uh, led to the initiated the mass exodus from the south to the outskirts of Baghdad and the creation of these shanty towns and uh, southern city that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to skip this because it, it took somehow longer than I thought. These are more examples. Um, so I'm going to address this. Now that I've addressed the theme of the state, I'll just discuss the role of oil, you know, the oil or uh, the role of uh, war has been already, you know, is already intertwined with these two, so I won't give it a dedicated time. I'll just very quickly go over the, um, you know, how, how I think oil um, has been part of the formation of Iraq. So, and this is something we talked about earlier today, the uh, Dante State um, theory, which in the 80s has uh, dominated scholarly writing on the significance of oil in, in, uh, in Iraq politics and political economy. The basic premise of this literature, for those who are not familiar with it, is that oil rich states become authoritarian because of their control of oil rent. Oil rent or the, you know, the, the money they receive from selling the oil allows the state to become autonomous from society and not subject to societal pressure. And that enables the states to co-opt the population through populist policies and patronage and build a security apparatus with oil money to suppress dissent. So this uh, literature emerged in the 70s and coincided with the commencement of the Ba'athist rule. In the case of Iraq, the framework's dominance resulted in its basic thesis penetrating into the understanding of state power and Iraqi political history. So it just became very dominant. One main premise of the Iranti state thesis is the conviction that the Iraqi state, particularly during the Ba'athist period, was able to enhance its power and separate itself from social relations and pressures due to ex its exclusive capturing of oil rent. The state, on this view, acted upon society in an authoritarian, if not totalitarian manner, and became the center of power thanks to the abundant oil rents that came from um, that came to its control. The increased national income as a result of the nationalization of the oil industry in 1972 and the fact that most of the oil was derived from oil rent allowed Iraq to fit into that uh, paradigm very, very easily. So the dominance of, um, of the Dante state is problematic at multiple levels. I mentioned them briefly without discussing them we can do that later so i think it it depicts a misleading or misplaced causality between oil and democracy and this is a thesis uh, of timothy mitchell's uh, carbon democracy it's also misleading in terms of its portrayal of uh, the connection between state formation and the oil industry and that was elaborated by robert vitalis in the case of saudi arabia and his work america's kingdom 
And it also creates false binaries between state and society, obscuring complicated social and political relationships that produce and reproduce categories such as state and class. And this particular point has been addressed in multiple um, places by Adam Hania's work on the um, GCC. So moreover, the paradigm methodological approach focuses on the national as an enclosed and autonomous sphere of social relations that produce themselves independently from global connections. And like we heard earlier today, the, um, the political, you know, the economy of oil and oil is a global commodity, but then, you know, somehow its effect is, is only under, understood in this very narrow way. Um, I feel like I went way over time. So I'm just going to just, you know, go over the conclusion. I can go, you know, we can adjust the oil effect uh, later. So I, um, right. So, you know, these are, as I said, three interrelated themes. They, um, they co-constitute and be, uh, you know, social relations such as class, sect, the nation, only a brief, you know, if we have a brief historical overview, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see the prominence of war and armed violence. Um, I've mentioned the uh, Iran-Iraq um, war and actually its impact on uh, Iraq's political economy cannot be overstated. It altered the composition of labor force, diverted investments from civilian infrastructure, it has been quite uh, destructive, and that is combined, uh, combined by the uh, effects of the 91 war and the sanctions and then, um, and so on. So, I, you know, I'm going to stop here because I feel like I, I talked more than I wanted to. Um, and, and I will just leave that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to, to share the floor with Nida, al and, and Olivia. Uh, I will be brief in my comments. In fact, I'm going to focus on a few ideas with some questions, hmm? more than comments. Trying to, to bring what Nida raised to the present and referring also to other countries and situations. I, I think the, the, the central idea, uh, state met matters, no? It's, it's very interesting now and can be also useful for other analysis in, in the region, no? And the idea that uh, history is a key uh, approach to understand the state reality in the region, it's uh, fundamental. Um, I, when, when I read your chapter in the book and, and I heard you, I, I thought about how these three categories can be also uh, useful for other situation or countries. And it's not easy. <laughs> for the case of Iraq, it's, it's uh, probably uh, much more clear, no? But uh, it, it invited me to, to think about the role of the state after uh, 2011. Uh, uh, in 2011, during the so-called uh, Arab Spring, the people in the street asked the state to work, that it respond to basic needs of the people. No? And also later, after uh, 2011, like in Lebanon, for instance, when we saw the trash protest in 2015 and 16, uh, after the collapse of the waste uh, management, we, we, we find the question, no? The people want a real state who is able to respond to the demand of, of the people, no? And, but what we have seen after 2011, an extent, I think, perhaps we can discuss this, but I, I see an extended weakening of the state in all the region. The state have less capacity to deploy public policies on their own. Indeed, some regimes receive inter-monarchical financial solidarity to prevent political change, like Jordan or Morocco, no? But um, th 
the extended uh, uh, reality was a weakening of, of, of the states in, with their different uh, uh, singularities and, and so on. And it, it's interesting what you, you, you began to explain. It's uh, uh, the motto of artificiality, mm -hmm. perhaps in origin, but the state consolidation has changed the reality. And when we talk about this, I think there is another reason. It's about the legitimacy, mm -hmm. who is in, interested in, in to point no, the, the artificiality. In, in fact, they, they, they are talking about legitimacy, legitimacy no? related uh, to an effort to, to questions uh, is uh, legitima legitimacy. Then I, I would like to hear your um, comments about about this uh, general phenomenon in the last years of weakening perhaps you are not agree <laughs> totally with me in second place i would like to point out a recently reinforced phenomenon of political management and governance the proliferation of the technocratic um, um, card in many uh, governing in all the region. In the last 10 years, from Morocco to Iraq, many governments are integrated or led by technocratic prime ministers. It is assumed that they are more capable of an efficient management because they have been work in the World Bank or in IMF and so on, and because they know the, the rules of the of the global systems and so on, but in in they are they are uh, they are in, they are not elected. They are appointed by different uh, political um, forces, uh, conservative, uh, less conservative, uh, include the Islamist uh, governments have, have choose this card in different in different. Uh, in different uh, situation, no? In some countries, in fact, some protesters in the street asked for this kind of governance in Iraq, for instance. No? The, the, the opinion polls show that one of the first demand is a non-political government, a technocratic uh, government, no? Perhaps, and this is my question, no? Perhaps it has to do with a particular situation, the impasse of the political forces on the management of the state, then the easy, the easy solution is this uh, uh, standard. And to finish in third place, it's related with the Kurdistan in, in Iraq. No? To what extent the three mentioned categories, state, oil, war, can be also used in the case of Kurdistan? The autonomous region of Kurdistan in, in Iraq since the 90s. And to what extent do they explain the difficulties in def defining the status of the region and the difficulties also to establish the relation with the central government? Can we use these three categories at micro level for the, for, for the Kurdistan case? I, I wanted to be brief. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I know. It's horrible. Thank you so much. I mean, these, are, these are really great examples. Oh my gosh, I love these questions. Sorry, this is like going all over the place. Yeah, so I'm going to start with the end. I think you're absolutely, I think yes, the answer is yes. We can very much use those to talk about uh, Kurdistan. So, uh, um, you know, you brought the 90s, but, you know, it goes before then. So the 90s is when war had brought autonomy to the Kurds in a way. And, you know, started this ambition of a Kurdish autonomous, perhaps, state, uh, weakened the central state's control over that part. So he had the state and the war, right? Um, and then the oil, as we see now, it continues as a, as a major uh, tension between the Kurdish uh, autonomous region and the central state. So indeed, you know, these three themes continue uh, to define the, the Kurdish um, position in Iraq. So uh, absolutely, yes. Um, 
uh, the historical approach does it uh, I'm, I'm glad you think state matters is a, is a nice title um, uh, it took me a while to come up with it uh, does the historical approach work in other places easy I think it does actually you know there's this move now to decolonize everything and I think you know um, sometimes I find it quite tricky what that means but I think in, in the case of the Middle East if you take a longer historical approach you're giving um, oh, we, we, we start to understand that history in this region and people's memories don't start with the colonial presence. It's actually much longer than that. And, you know, the processes are longer than, you know, so it kind of decenters the importance of the colonial, um, of, the, of, the, of the colonial influence and kind of gives us a, kind of a deeper picture into the social and political structures that exist in the region. Uh, so this is, I, I think, in the Middle East, it's very, very much apparent. And, um, you know, in the discussion for this particular book, uh, you know, what's the name? Uh, Shireen Saikhali also brought it in the context of, of Palestine, right? You know, do you start the history talking about it since the conflict, since 48, or do you start before? Depends on when you start, you draw a very different political picture and historical picture. So, you know, it is almost a political choice as much as a methodological choice to take a longer um, historical uh, period. I'll be much briefer in my answers than in... <laughs> so uh, the role of the state uh, post 2011 and the Arab uh, Spring. So people are demanding, uh, uh, people are demanding a state. Absolutely right. And um, and I think the weakening of the state is actually starts before 2011. I think it started with the invasion of Iraq. I think that had changed the um, the dynamics in the region and and brought in you know um, uh, non gave non state actors more power than they ever had before. And these kind of interventions within the region uh, had had backfired. So Syria allowed its borders to become you know. Uh, a pathway to Iraq, uh, but that backfired on Syria later on and, and led to, um, you know, um, other problems. So, so I think actually the weakening of the, of the state starts much earlier than, than 2003. And if there is a turning point, it's two, uh, 2011. The turning point is 2003. And arguably, you know, perhaps the states were not that strong to begin with to, to be able to absorb these shocks, um, or some states were not able. So maybe the weakening was there even before then. Um, the artificiality, the legitimacy. So I think there are, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I like the way you use legitimacy because that's how I understand it, you know, is that it's not about, you know, is this a democratic regime that we voted or not, but is that a system that we want to buy? Is the state what we want or not? Um, so I think for the population at large, as demonstrated by the Arab Spring and what you mentioned, people do want a state. The flags. And they want the flags and they want to end sectarianism and they want, so that it has legitimacy. And I, don't, I think it has very strong legitimacy on the street, but then the lack of legitimacy is by these people, right? The ISIS, the uh, some Arab nationalists who think that you know this is what we need is, a, is an Arab nation, and you know uh, some Orientalists and and um, and sometimes imperialists don't see the point of the of the state. So so you know there's that tension, and I, I, I you know thank you for bringing it up. Uh, I don't think I've I've seen that you know, brought up before. The uh, final point that you brought up is the political management um, and the technocratic card. Uh, I, you know, I think you already answered that, that this is, um, this is more of a, um, how do you say, can't think of it, the word in English. I don't know, I wouldn't know it in Spanish, but you know, sort of a way to beautify things. It's sugar, sugar coating, because like you said, um, they're not elected, but then most importantly, I, I know very well in the case of Iraq, there are people like um, Renard Mansour and Toby Dodge who have been working, do, you know, writing interesting papers about how, wh why it became very difficult to reform the governance inside the ministries because the the ministers themselves don't have that much power even if they're technocrats the power actually lies in the middle management that is very much connected to political parties and political militias and so there's a kind of a 
an, a state within a state, right? So even a technocratic head, uh, you know, um, is, won't be able to control these people, even if they have intentions. So again, I mean, this also speaks about state capacity and, and the strength of the institutions and, and its collapse. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you want, we can pass. If there are any questions from the public, we encourage the, some of the students if they want to make any questions. I have a couple of questions, but I wanted to open the floor in case there are any, either from the floor or from the audience. I don't know if online we have some questions. But uh, I start with a couple of questions while maybe you think about your own question. I have, I mean, there are many issues that we could talk about. I mean, it's a very interesting point because I mean, the whole history of Iraq as you were, is, it really raises a lot of points and connection. I mean, Aurelia, you want to, to but no, I just want to, maybe let me just, um, one of the questions, and then I pass you the, the floor, was about, we were talking about them, in, I mean, you didn't have time to develop much about the, the role of oil no, in the, in the part. So in that sense, we finalized the, the previous session speaking about how um, in the state of Iraq, I mean, speaking about the state and the grace, I mean, because I, I mean, I really like the difference between um, the idea of the, the legitimate, it's a question of legitimization more than if it's artificial or artificial, because at the end it's what matters. No, every country is artificial in a way, no, in a way, no, in, in, in fact, no, but the things that depend on where you go in history. But speaking about if we, we were mentioning, I mean, of course, you, you explain very well the different um, what was before the 1920s when we were started the previous session, but if we, um, we were mentioning in relation to oil in the between estate and oil. Um, we were if if um, we accept uh, Aurelia's point that uh, the state of Iraq was uh, was in a way created as an independent state in the 1920s to uh, allow for the oil concessions to be delivered to the international companies. So how would that play a role then in the coming years, and then. Uh, also with the nationalization of the oil uh, companies uh, in, the 19, in 1972, and then also in the, in the war on, on or in the invasion of Iraq. Or how, so if it was granted that, that independency to, to allow for these uh, this, uh, oil concessions, what happened then to really lose that? I mean, in a way, I mean, uh, Iraq was creating and Iraq was about to be destroyed fully. I mean, in 2000, and it is it's still a miracle that it still is holding. And in that sense, it's interesting that it's, it's, that the people is asking for to, the state to, to remain in that sense because it's a guarantee also of their stability. So that was a question if you can develop a bit more about what can we say that Iraq as, as it was necessary for the international uh, economic order was not Mm -hmm. So necessary in the, in the 2000s, no, mm -hmm. or in that sense, they they were, and they they took the risk of this, or almost destroying the state of Iraq in in spite of that. So that's that's one question. I have another question, but I leave uh, Aurelia maybe no, to. Exactly. Yeah, I continue. <laughs> yeah, but I don't want to take too much too much. Time. Another yeah. question that in the previous seminar you also mentioned about the this idea mm -hmm. of the local or the small economies, mm -hmm. and also in relation to the. Uh, I mean, because the point of, of, I mean, it's also, I mean, when you study the creation of this modern state, you also read it with the creation of the national market, no? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the very, in the history, in economic history. So in that sense, also, you can see one risk or something that undermines the state of, of Iraq nowadays, I guess, is the destruction of all these economic relations that were holding the state. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, this is in relation to the war economy and then the, the militias and the, the small economies you were mentioning. I don't know if you could develop it more, how this is putting under risk the, the, the sustain, sustainability of the state of Iraq. Yeah. Thank you. These are very challenging questions. Um, so I think, okay, um, if I understand your, okay, so, I, you know, okay, so he, here's, here's how it goes, I think. Um, to focus on 
the um, needs and intentions of the interventions is, is one thing, but I think we can give it too much power than what it actually has. Um, the, you know, uh, um, I, I really saw that come to life in a book by Orit Bashkin called The New Babylonians about the, the Iraqi Jews um, around the formation of the state. And then you could see how even before the state came as a mandate, um, ideas about nationalism, what to do, you know, how should the state look like were already there. So it's not something that was brought to Iraq by the imperial powers. It's something that was already discussed. And you know, this is not to say that Iraqi nationalism is eternal and was always there, but these are movements in the 19th century in the region that were already taking place. So the idea of a state was already there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not just an imperial imposition. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an intervention that did you know, change things on the ground but it didn't act alone. You know, people resisted. There were different things. So I, you know, I, I'd be cautious not to give it too much. Um, but I think you're right. You know, it is the, the war in 2003. I mean, I, I really don't understand um, <laughs> what happened uh, because within the American administration, not everyone was of the same view. You know, as a matter of fact, the State Department was much more cautious, was much more for preserving as, as much as possible to, to avoid that collapse. So, you know, again, uh, this is, you know, when we talk, uh, not to look at um, the, you know, the administration as one unit that thinks coherently, even within the United States government, things were not always, people did not always agree. And not everyone wanted what have happened to actually, you know, the, the, not everyone agreed with the policies. So I think it's, it would be interesting to see, uh, to look into the dynamics within the American administration and how that led um, the, yeah, so I think, you're absolutely right. You know, one of the biggest challenges, and maybe this is a question for all of you because that kind of puzzles me a lot, you know, whether we can bring or rescue a Weberian understanding of the state and the connection between violence and the ability of the state to exist. Um, whether, you know, whether we can bring that back as a key because like you say, the um, national economies are very much jeopardized by the capturing of economic pockets by militias. So again, it is this, you know, lack of the, con I mean, there's never a monopoly of a means of violence 100%, but then when it goes to the, to the extent that the national economy is also compromised, um, uh, then there's the real question whether the state would be able to regain its, um, its, its, um, capacity to um, project its own order uh, across the borders rather than be subjected to different orders depending on which political party controls what area. I have a concrete question and then maybe something to talk, but I don't know if I, but the concrete question is, uh, well, you quote today, well, you, you speak about Mitchell and oil, okay? And if I read correctly, when I read Mitchell, the, the main idea was that, for instance, in Europe, uh, oil was gone because that was the end of the, of the, well, of the labor um, demonstrations and vindications, and that was the end of the, the, the of democracy in some way because of oil, because there there is no need of people to to extract oil, and you need miners to to extract coal. Yeah. So, in the case of Iraq, for me. Uh, I don't know if you are suggesting that, but mm. maybe it's an interesting idea if you are not. I mean, it's that you mean that in some way to transform not these countries in all countries because they have oil. So that this is something that you cannot avoid, mm -hmm. but in a concrete, um, I mean, in a concrete state, oil state, sorry, mm -hmm. 
would that it mean that this was the way, the way also of blocking democracy in Iraq? Mm -hmm. it's, it's what you are suggesting. Yeah, yeah I, I think perhaps, you know, I, I find that part of carbon democracy quite convincing, you know, that um, the ability the democracy is not a good is not a translation of a good idea that people get convinced by because there are you know smart people who and enlightened people who did not agree to extend democracy democratic rights in Europe and, and the United States and, until they came under pressure. And the only way they came under pressure is because, like you said, there was uh, you know mass democracy was brought by labor action that was only possible because labor was able to obstruct the generation of wealth. And labor can no longer do that because of the way the oil economy works. So I think that, you know, I find that actually quite convincing. And then I think we talked in the break about, you know, um, I find it fascinating that Iraq and Iran had a strong presence of the, of the communist parties and very, very strong and very effective. Um, and I think, Part of the reason, while you don't see the same kind of mobilization in other uh, oil or petro states in the region, I mean, you see it in Latin America, but you don't see it in other petro states. And I think this really has to do with the timing. I, I, I actually do agree with you that, you know, when in Iraq and Iran, these processes of the state and the you know, of, of the state uh, attempts to build and, and, and incorporate have started before oil came into uh, into the picture and and you know allowed um, allowed for these kind of um, forces to exist uh, and now they're completely irrelevant right but then they did exist at some point and they were very powerful but you don't see the same in other places where the state emergence came later uh, so I, I find it you know uh, to be convincing. Um, but I mean, who knows? I don't want to be, you know, who knows how the democratic. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the other question that I have in my mind then is that a deterministic view? I mean, is, uh, you know, can democratic gains be, be claimed in other ways, that, you know, that, um, that don't mimic the 19th century and early 20th century labor movements? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah. um, now that you're talking about Iran, uh, that's interesting. We are actually doing uh, some work about Iran. So I would like to ask uh, if you could say something about the influence Iran had on Iraq in recent years. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it's, I don't think I have much to say, except it's there. <laughs> it's very strong. And partly uh, thanks to the uh, American mishandling of the situation in 2003, it opened the way for the um, Iranian influence in Iraq to, to become quite, um, to come in quickly and, and, uh, and they understood the country much more, I think, and, and were able to um, uh, consolidate their influence in Iraq um, early on, in, you know, after 2003 uh, invasion. Um, and I think in connection to something we were talking, you know, in, during your session, you know, these are um, powers of hegemony in the region um, that these, you know, this is, we, you know, this is one, one aspect of it, the Iranian influence in Iraq and, and other parts, but it is, it is quite strong. And part of the protest movement is against the Iranian influence in the country. So um, absolutely. I mean, the Americans opened the doors to the Iranians in ways that they haven't dreamt, the Iranians have not dreamt of before. Um, Kind of ironic, but yes. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, it was really interesting. Um, my question is more general, but um, I wanted to ask you: if, How do you see or imagine the next steps for Iraq in the consolidation of the state? Um, considering some of the things you've mentioned and the situation of maybe the distrust by the population to the government mm -hmm. and the 
Um, and the continued war effects because there has been only 10 years like now. So it's more like, how do you see, no, like the future of Iraq? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm not very optimistic, um, mainly because it's hard to see how, you know, because the, it, it, it has reached a point where there are multiple centers of power that have that are equal in a way so it, it would be difficult to see how people would give up their power just to give in to the I mean again going to Avebe and maybe Hobbesian now I don't know. <laughs> you know there is the balance of power that is held in the country and is working fine for those involved so the rational it would not you know if I were one of you know it's, it's not rational to give it up and allow for, um, I mean, what would the central state be like? Um, you know, it's, it, it never was a theoretical idea in any, any part of the world. It's always a political struggle. So looking at it politically rather than as a nice idea, it's hard to see um, how these tensions are going to be res resolved in the, in the near future. So I think it, it, it might be a while. Um, before the state can, you know, regain control um, or consolidate itself. I mean, the popular demand, you know, people are not happy with it. I suppose, you know, one difference from Lebanon is that this system is relatively new and young. So, you know, maybe it's not as entrenched as, uh, you know, Lebanon. Uh, maybe then that, you know, uh, gives it much more flexibility. Uh, but, you know, I, I can't, I, you know, I can't see the future, but from what is going on now, it's hard to see how that would change anytime soon. But it's possible, you know, it's not a, there's historical precedent in Iraq for um, a unitary state, you know, kind of a, a, a state that at least looks uh, consolidated, even if it's not entirely so. It's interesting the, the comparison with Lebanon because I was just thinking that I mean there there have been different research on that especially um, there was a thesis here by Amaya Ona on on the um, banking system in Lebanon and in a way you you see how the equilibrium till working till recently in Lebanon is result on, of the war economy yes. that came out of the civil war and how the, the difficulty of, of changing this is not a question of quotas in the political system yeah. is the equilibrium of power that is between the different how the economic and political power has been distributed between the different uh, warlords no in a way yeah. or the different groups uh, in, involved in the in the conflict so i'm wondering that Paul, i mean I'm, I, uh, it, it sounds what you said uh, comparing it with Lebanon, that uh, a result of the of the invasion and the war in in Iraq, the situation now is a bit at that level. No, that there is certain yeah. equilibrium of economic and political power that's going to be difficult to change. No, or yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there are others who do more contemporary work than I do and understand how things work better. But I wonder about the entrenchment of the sectarian system within society and how deep is that compared to the Lebanese way not that sectarianism never existed in Iraq until 12 years ago or you know um, 20 years ago it was always there but it's been politicized mm -hmm. since the American invasion and that's you know compared to the Lebanese case is kind of a very very you know uh, yeah. very small period of time and so you know I wonder whether there is a difference in in how structural it has become yeah. um, in the same way that it is in Lebanon, where even if you want to opt out of the system, you can, you're kind of trapped into it. So, um, you know, I wonder if, if that's the case in Iraq across society, or is it just the militias and then others who are not involved uh, mm -hmm. are a different story are not necessarily benefiting. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that would be the, you know, the qualitative mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. Vale, no sé si hay más preguntas por el público. Sí, una cogemos esa última y se espera. We, we take that one and then we... Close. Okay, sorry, I spoke too much. Um, yeah, mine is a really quick question, but um, you've referred to the... Well, it has... Uh, the Kurdish regions have been mentioned uh, in talk. 
in the conference, how do you think do you think they will have any effect in the future of Iraq? And if if they will in any way, are they if they're able to these um, uh, the the stabilize sorry affect the actual the powers that are now in 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 Iraq to stabilize or destabilize destabilize sorry yeah. destabilize yeah yeah um, I mean I you know I don't know it's it, again you know I'm not a big fan of speculation I think they like any other party. I think before, so before the 2003, just before the invasion, right, there was lots of speculation whether the country would just fall into these three categories very quickly, easily, you know, Shia, Sunni, Kurd, right? But then people who knew the country thought the only fallout is going to be the Kurds, you know, because they always wanted, them, you know, they always wanted autonomy. They always had these nationalistic demands and they had their own region for a long time. So um, I don't think this can be reversed. And I think, you know, it's, um, you know, would that destabilize the country that there's an autonomous uh, Kurdish region? Not necessarily. I mean, why would it, right? Um, if there's, you know, Iraq does not have to be, uh, uh, what do you call it, the opposite of a, yeah, I mean, it can still be a federation, a federal system, it can still be a federal system and a strong state. I mean, this is, these two don't contradict each other. So the problem, you know, the, you know, the Kurdish issue comes in, in the federal arrangement. And that does not necessarily lead to a state weakening. Um, but then the sectarian quota system is what arguably has weakened um, the state structure. Um, so I don't, you know, it's not necessary that, that the Kurdish autonomy would would be a destabilizing uh, effect. Bueno, no sé si hay alguna pregunta. ¿Quieres hacer alguna vez ahí, hacer un comentario o terminamos? Okay. So thank you very much, Nina. I think we have passed, uh, bueno, we are more or less the same because we started a bit late, but thank you a lot. I mean, it was a lot. Uh, a lot to, to cover, so we understand that, that you took a bit of time. It's completely fine. It was very, I hope you find it very interesting. Uh, thanks a lot for following up, you and those following up from, from the distance from the really from sorry, I never went over time, but I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you for your patience. Thank you very thanks much. You. Oh, thank you. As líderes y, y actores importantes desde Putros Gali a Osama Bin Laden y otros y nada, es, es un, se trata de, de la conferencia que hacemos en colaboración con el Máster de Periodismo Internacional de la Universidad de Juan Carlos y, y está, estáis, eh, bueno, sois bienvenidos también si os interesa, será el, el jueves 25 a las, a las 6, así que nada, terminamos con esto, gracias. Bueno,